I do seem to have a recent history of writing about violent children. <laughs> and children attacking their parents and, and children wanting vengeance on adults. I did it with The Night's Life of Louis Drax, where you have a little boy in a coma who's seeking revenge from inside his coma. Uh, I did it again in The Rapture, my most recent novel, uh, in which there's a 14-year-old girl who, who goes completely berserk all over the place on a massive scale, but has her own reasons for, for wanting some kind of vengeance. Uh, and now, in the case of the uninvited, what I've got is children all over the world, I and mean, we're talking big populations of children. Hesketh Locke, who's the central character, he's an anthropologist, he is uh, employed to troubleshoot problems in, in the workplace, in companies. Uh, he works for a big corporation, uh, a legal team is involved, they send him in to troubleshoot and his background as an anthropologist helps him to discern patterns in, of whatever's going wrong in the workplace and so forth. There have been some interesting and unusual spates of sabotage all around the world and he's investigating those and they become, they become odder and odder. And at the same time there appears to be some sort of epidemic of child violence beginning in the UK and bit by bit it emerges that other countries are seeing the same thing. And very slowly he comes to the terrible conclusion that they're linked and that it's not two separate epidemics, it's one. You could see the whole story in terms of a gigantic guilt complex played out uh, across the world, if you like, but it's not really that. Uh, one of the things that interests me enormously, and, and I read a lot about during the writing of this book, self-delusion and self-deception. I think if there is, if there is any emotion or anything being played out, it's, it's that. It's the fact that as human beings we are somehow uh, programmed to lie to ourselves. It's part of our evolutionary biology, if you like. I, I think there are, there are probably very good reasons why we are natural optimists. Uh, and it's to do with self-preservation. Uh, if, if we faced up to all the truths about ourselves, we would probably crumble into a heap. Uh, and the same goes for institutions and corporations and governments. No one wants to look bad to themselves. And so really that's what I was investigating in the course of this. How is it that we can be hypocritical on the scale that we are, to claim to love our children and claim to want the best for their futures and yet wreck those futures, which we know we're doing. Deep down, we, we do, well not even that deep down, we do know that that's what we're doing. And what, what moral obligation do we have to future generations? Some people will argue we don't have any. Uh, we should just take care of the people who are here and now in our world. Um, people like Bjorn Lomborg, who, who was, uh, as we know, G George W. Bush's favourite climate scientist, he argues that, that we should simply look after the starving now and, and, and apply all our energies and, 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 and so forth to, to what's going on now. Um, I would argue that actually, of course that's important, but you've got to look at the numbers, you've got to look at how huge the population is growing, um, and that more and more I think is something that is being talked about uh, rather late in the day, but it is. Um, so there's population, there's climate, and there's food, and there's water. I mean, these are going to be gigantic issues in, in the future lives of our children and our grandchildren. To what extent uh, are we not just culpable, because culpability is, is almost pointless to discuss. Um, it's responsibility and what we do about it that actually is a big moral question of our times, and one that needs addressing and I only wish church leaders would address it a little bit more. I'm always puzzled by how little they seem to touch on it. I've read all of John Wyndham and I had him in mind a lot. Uh, I also had J.G. Ballard in mind a lot when I was writing this. Uh, they were the two heroes behind the book, if you like. Uh, I particularly love The Day of the Triffids and the Chrysalids uh, by John Wyndham and I like the way he, he uses science um, but always, always manages to make the stories he tells personal. And that's the key 
to this kind of story? How do you tell it through one person? How do you tell a huge story through one person or a small group of people who may actually have not much to do with the genesis of the story or, or with the catastrophe that's being played out? They have to make it up as they go along and find out as they go along. I like to switch genres. Uh, and I think that's because as well as I'm an impatient reader and I think I'm also an impatient writer. I, I don't like to do the same thing twice or feel that I'm doing the same thing twice. I probably do end up doing the same thing twice or more than twice. But I like to feel in the course of writing that I'm doing something new, I'm doing something different, I'm doing something I've never done before. So we can call this book The Uninvited a Thriller. We can also call it a ghost story. And that's certainly what I called it to myself when I started writing it. And my starting point was, OK, I want to write a ghost story, but I want to write a ghost story that doesn't have a single haunted house with a creaky door in sight, because I'm sick of those. I, they have their place. I've enjoyed them enormously. Um, I'm a huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe, for example. Um, and I have loved all that, but I didn't want to do that myself. And so to me, uh, the challenge was, okay, how do you write a modern ghost story? How do you make ghosts relevant in modern times? Because it seems to me that ghosts in fiction have traditionally been all about something or someone from the past having unfinished business and messing with people in the present and scaring the crap out of them. And that's, that's all very well, <laughs> but it's not what I wanted to do. So I wanted to do um, a ghost story in which we have a modern, brightly lit, high-tech world in which some kind of spirit force has some kind of sway in a manner that's so difficult to understand that at first it seems to take the form of a medical epidemic of some, time, of some kind, a, an epidemic of mass hysteria among children and certain adults who start committing very bizarre sabotages. At the beginning of the novel, Hesketh Locke, my hero, has gone through a split. Um, he wasn't married, but his ex has a son. Uh, he's not the father of this boy, but he loves him. And that's the one relationship that is uh, something he's absolutely sure about in this novel. He knows he loves this boy. He doesn't really know who else he loves or who he has loved. Uh, his ex calls him on various occasions a robot ma made of meat and this hurts him somehow. He knows he's not a robot made of meat. Um, he knows he is someone with feelings and those feelings uh, come to the fore with this boy because they have a connection uh, which is very pure and very straightforward and it's to do actually with making things, with doing boy activities and with uh, Freddy, the, the young boy, being a, a seven-year-old child, not knowing that there is such a thing as Asperger's syndrome and not caring if his stepfather may seem odd to, to other people, to other adults. Freddy loves his stepfather, his stepfather loves him, and that's the central uh, relationship that's carried all the way through the book. And because of Hesketh's rationality, if you like, he will not accept that when Freddy turns into another kind of child altogether and does um, some very frightening, unacceptable things, he knows that Freddy is still Freddy, no matter what. When you set out to write a ghost story, which is what I did, uh, it's best not to explain too much. I think part of what's scary is the unexplained, and so I think Although most thrillers, if you like, they end with some kind of conclusion, there is a way in which all the ends are tied up in the final chapter. I didn't want this to happen with my story because there is always, on the last page, I think the last page of every ghost story is written by the reader. Mm -hmm.